Presented by Caltech. So I just have to pass on this break and get a recap of what the solution to the equation of motion is there. Just to remind us and so make use of it here. I want to think a little bit about energy. In our oscillator. Um, we define our coordinate system such that when x is equal to zero, uh, the potential energy u at x equals zero is zero. We define that to be the equilibrium position, and we'll take the zero of our we'll take our potential energy to be defined as uh, the energy relative to the zero position, the energy of the spring relative to the zero position. So we'll find it to be zero at the equilibrium position, just for convenience. We don't have to, but that's how we're going to. <coughs> um, and when V is equal to zero, then our kinetic energy is equal to zero. Whatever time that happens at. Uh, so more generally, we can we actually know how to calculate our, our energy, our potential energy is the energy of either compression or extension in the spring. Potential energy at, as a function of x. So I've written it as a function of x there. So I'll write it as a function of x here instead of as a function of time, which I could also write it as. But this is convenient. So that's the integral from 0 to wherever I am of, of the force, the force through distance. Potential energy is a force through a distance. Uh, except that um, um, the force, as you know, is a restoring force. So it's opposing x, so it's in a negative direction. That is, uh, in this case, we have f of x is equal to minus du by dx evaluating x. Because the force is trying to reduce the potential energy. <coughs> and so I can plug in what the force is, 0 to x of, well, put small, so that the force, the restoring force, is, is uh, uh, negative kx. And this integral is easy to do, that's just one half kx squared. One potential energy stored in a spring. So this thing we're going to. No, that's what you get when you're moving like this. So I'll move it up a little bit. Let's see it. Or if I plug in what x is as a function of time, I can write, being a little sloppy with my notation, I can write the potential energy as a function of time, using the same symbol for, for potential energy, it is 1 half k times x squared. So I wrote x up there, so now I'm using c squared, cosine squared, omega t plus phase 5. So that's my potential energy as a function of time. So what about the kinetic energy? So that's the energy of the motion of this thing. So I'm using the notation uh, here in the system of the book, the kinetic energy is denoted by K for kinetic. 
lowercase k, which I'll try to make it look like a capital. Well, that's just one half m v squared. Of course, we're assuming all this, so I haven't explicitly stated some of these assumptions yet, but we're assuming all this, there's no mass in that spring. So all the mass is in, in the mass that's connected to the end of the spring, so that has mass m, and it's the motion of that mass that has all the communication pieces, because the spring is considered to be massless. Well, it's an approximation. We could try to handle a spring that has mass, uh, but the springs we had in our, 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 our demo were fairly light, so it's a reasonable approximation. We, we, could, we could handle it. Though. Okay, so let's see. So this is equal to one half m x dot squared, so just writing the velocity as x dot dx by dt. Or <coughs> if I write the kinetic energy as a function of time, I plug in what x dot is. I've also written that up there. I put the one half m, uh, and then I get c squared, omega squared, sine squared, omega t plus five. So total energy is just a sum of these. So let's see what the total energy is a function of, of time. Um, we can notice, I wrote down what omega was up there. So omega squared is just k over m. So let me use that. So the total energy B equals u plus k is just equal to, well, one half uh, a c squared cosine squared omega t plus five. So that's the potential energy part. And then the kinetic energy part uh, is just one half m times omega squared is just m times k over m, which is just k c squared, sine squared, omega t plus 5. And you see a wonderful thing happens. It's always nice to get things that add up to a lot and so forth. So, so cosine squared and sine squared are times the same factor. So you get to replace those two terms in one and just end up with one half kc squared. So the total energy is independent of time. Well, my final phase is going to work. What's that mean? So the energy is a constant. That's what it means. It means energy is conserved. analysis of the problem, we haven't put any place where energy can get lost. It's all either in the potential energy of the motion or the kinetic energy of the motion or some combination of the two. It sloshes back and forth between the potential energy and the kinetic energy. It's always the same total. Of course, when we actually looked at the demo, the spring slowed down. And eventually, uh, the motion eventually got to pretty much zero. Our solutions, our solutions here, never slow down. Every every cycle, x goes to the same maximum position. Yeah. Time after time, all goes to the same place. So we have a little bit more work to do because while we got a nice approximation from what's going on, it is an approximation. We didn't capture everything that's going on. Um, and so we'll, next week, we'll try to do a little better. But for now, we'll just say, OK, with the system, the ideal system that we've analyzed, energy is conserved. 
You don't go anywhere. Just stays in the differential or differential. So in the same sphere, I'd like to uh, do two more examples. <coughs> on Tuesday. Um, let me draw a picture of uh, kind of the scheme that I've got. So the equilibrium position of this pendulum I'll write, I'll write like this. It's always it's a mass M suspended from this, this consider this to be a rigid rod. go up by, say, some height above the minimum, or if you like, by some angle theta with respect to the equilibrium position. Of course, I'm, I'm tending to start to pick coordinate systems here, but then I'm trying to pick them to make things look easy. That's always a good idea. There are some more chairs if people want to sit in them, but maybe, maybe you're happy over there. This is probably all we gave us will happen. Um, so let's let's define the length to this rod, call it L. And I want to describe the motion as a function of time, just like I did for my mass on a spring. Um, so we're going to neglect the mass of that rod. So, so we're, we suppose it's on a massless, rigid rod. And, and the massless part is just because I don't want to complicate the problem with some distributed mass. I want to act like the mass is all at a single point. Uh, although we could certainly try to analyze the other situation. Um, and being rigid is just I want to enforce that you know, I'm not bouncing up and down somehow or something. So I just want to make sure I don't have any motion in that direction. The motion is all in the angular direction. And in particular, um, I'm only going to consider the motion in a plane. I'm not going to consider the fact that the pendulum could go around in a circle like this. We can analyze that too. But let's keep things simple for now. So let's do one dimensional motion. Just motion in the plane of the blackboard. Okay, so we want to find the equations of motion, or the equation of motion, uh, and um, we could do it the same way we did the spring. We could look at the forces. And that would be a perfectly reasonable way to do it, and we would get an answer. It wouldn't be too hard. Uh, well, except there will be a gotcha in here, but it wouldn't be too, too hard if we deal with a gotcha. Uh, let's do it a different way, though. I just want to see that you know, there's more than one way to solve a problem. So let's solve this problem in another way. Let's look at the energy. The book looks at the energy, too. I'm going to do it slightly differently than the book, just a variety. <coughs> Okay, and the idea of looking at looking at the energy is I'm going to make the assumption once again that I'm not losing any energy. So it's again an idealized situation. We, we know that we did lose energy gradually. Um, but I'm going to take the ideal situation where we don't lose any energy. So I'm going to use, I'm going to input, into the beginning, I'm going to input energy conservation and get my equation of motion by using that. And this turns out to often be a very handy way to, to do a, a problem like this. In some ways, it's simpler than looking at the forces. OK, potential energy. U equals mgh. OK, the mass times acceleration of gravity times 
this height. Again, I'm taking the zero of the potential energy being my equilibrium position. So I'm choosing some, uh, some things here, but there are things that I can choose. I can choose. I, choose. I, I could choose my zero somewhere else to carry along. I mean, why make it any messier? It won't, it won't change the final answer. Well, you could, you could try to prove this. Okay. So u equals zero at h equals zero. Okay, but wait, before I go too far with this, um, I've kind of taken h to be my coordinate. Uh, and let's think about that. It's a good idea to kind of think about what coordinate system you're going to use before you get too far in something. Make sure that you've chosen something that makes your life easy. Um, and h is perfectly fine. We could go on with this and, and it would work. Uh, one problem we see with h kind of immediately is that, you know, it's the same, it's the same banner there. So it doesn't tell us which side of the equilibrium position we're on, and you know, that's something they might want to know. So H has that flaw, we can probably fix it somehow. Um, but the other thing to notice is, is that, you know, this motion is, is really a circular motion. So why not use an angular coordinate that captures that circularity? So instead of h, I'm going to use theta. And so theta is equal to 0 at the equal position. It can go either positive or negative. And it, so the whole root position is completely known from that. So, so I know that u is at gh. I've got to translate that to theta. So let's see, so let's draw as best I can um, the situation. Okay, so there's L, there's L, there's, if I make a projection across, here's H, here's L minus H, here's theta. Okay. So I know that L minus H is just equal to L times the cosine of theta. Or H equals um, L times 1 minus cosine theta. So I plug that into there. <laughs> U equals MGL 1 minus cosine theta. So now I have my potential energy expressed in terms of the coordinate that I want, which is theta. You might say, okay, gosh, that looks a lot more complicated than MGH. And indeed it does. Um, so you can rethink whether that was the best choice of coordinate or not. But let's think about the kinetic energy, because we have to deal with that too. So the speed of the mass is just, or V is just L theta dot. Actually, it's the velocity because theta dot's the same quantity, but I call it speed. Okay. That's just the speed that it's executing. There, the angular coordinate is a nice coordinate because it's easy to write. It'd be a little more complicated if I had to write it in terms of h. Because the speed is not just h changing, it's, it's this direction changing too. So, so the kinetic energy K is just one half mv squared is equal to one half ml squared theta dot squared. Okay, so now I have potential <laughs> energy, I have kinetic energy, I can add them and do whatever I think I have to do with that. But let's first get the total energy because we, we suggest that. <laughs> Uh, conserved. Total energy conserved. So, okay, it's an assumption, but we know it's approximately true. It approximately comes back to the same position as started with. So, E is equal to K plus U. Okay, so that's one half M L squared. Theta dot squared uh, 
plus MGL times there it is. One minus plus and theta. Great. And that's supposed to be a constant. Let's just uh, rewrite it a little bit. Collect our thoughts and get rid of some symbols that we don't need. So I'm going to re-express. So I'm just going to. Uh, so I'm going to just divide by e over m l is equal to one half l theta dot squared plus g one minus cos theta. That's equal to a constant. Of course, this piece is already a constant, so I could take that, I absorb that into a constant. And so we get a to dot squared, I'm going to multiply by 2 over L to minus 2G over L cos theta is equal to some constant. And let me call that constant D, a constant. Name my constant D. So, okay, so we have a differential equation. All we need to do is solve this differential equation. Let's see, so, so let's see the so differential equation. is nonlinear. The bigger I make my amplitude, the different, the more different things are going to happen. But if I make the amplitude really big and put it, you know, up here and give it a little initial velocity, it's going to go around in a circle. Well, that's simple motion, but that's a lot different than this back and forth motion if I don't do that. Well, it seems a lot different. So this, 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 actually, this can be done. You can do it. You can do the integral. Uh, you know, it's just, you're just integrating it. It's only a first order differential equation. That's what conservation of energy bought us. In general, if you deal with the forces, you'll have a thing of double dot. And you'll have a second order differential equation. Using conservation of energy, effectively does one of those integrals on that theta double dot for you. And so you end up with a, so this kind of a theme, this kind of a general theme, so you end up with a first order differential equation. In this case, it looks kind of ugly, but in fact you can do it. It's doable. Uh, it's messy, you get logs of tangents, those are things. Ratios of log, ratios of the analog. Uh, but you get one and so that. Um, <clears throat> so, but maybe that's maybe we don't want to solve the general problem. Maybe we're interested in, in really kind of small motion, which we often are interested in the effect of you know kind of perturbing the system and seeing how the, what the motion behaves like. So <clears throat> let's talk about small oscillations. Often it's sufficient to know how things behave under small oscillations. Uh, and that may be true for our pendulum. So let's do that. So the potential energy. Let's look again at the potential energy. Mu equals MGL 1 minus cos and theta. I mean, that's the source of this cos and theta here that gives us all the trouble. I mean, if that was just 
clean it up and make it be a lot easier. But uh, it's not. Let's see. So this the potential energy as a function of theta, uh, if here is pi over two minus pi over two and pi and so forth, minus uh, pi if you like. Uh, so at pi over two, uh, so at at uh, theta equals zero we have zero. At pi over two we have uh, mgl. Plus or minus pi over two, and the maximum is at plus or minus pi, where we have two mgl for the potential energy. So it goes like this, it's cosine, so it's going to go like this, and like that. And, and of course, if pi wraps around, it will be part of that. So that's our potential energy. Now, down here, in this region around the origin, it becomes like a quadratic sort of dependence, uh, something like a quadratic dependence. But so what do we do? If we're only if we're dealing with small oscillations, we're dealing with small theta. What do we do with small theta? We make a Taylor series expansion. So we expand our potential energy function in a Taylor series. Let's see. Uh. You know, theta equals, so our Taylor series is just, I'm going to, I'm going to do the Taylor series expansion about um, theta equals zero, about the equilibrium it's, position. It's better to use this. It doesn't work. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I was wondering if that was going to be the case. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> U of zero plus theta minus zero to the first power divided by one factorial. U a value of u d u by d theta, if you like, evaluated at theta equals zero plus theta minus zero squared divided by two factorial d u d squared u by d theta squared. All the back the value we get at theta equals zero for the derivative uh, plus I'll just write one more theta minus zero cubed over three factorial d cubed u by d theta cubed evaluating at theta equals zero and so forth. Okay, that's the Taylor series expansion. And so now we can do those derivatives. U of zero we have chosen already to be zero. U by d theta, well, that's just mgl sine theta. Derivative one minus cosine theta. Just sine theta. d squared by d theta, u by d theta, is just uh, mgl cosine theta. So this guy, the u by d theta, is equal to zero at theta equals zero. This guy at theta equals zero is just MGL. And we'll see that only even derivatives contribute. You think of physically why that kind of has to be. So therefore, u of theta is equal to, well, the, the first two terms, the u of zero and the du of theta go away, is both zero, is just mgl theta squared plus order of theta to the fourth, since the theta the cube term is zero. So we know what uh, u is up to order theta cubed. 
at least that's what we're going to keep. So, um, so let's use this expression. Uh, okay, so the so order beta cubed, we have we have what? We have the energy, the total energy is one half ml beta dot squared kinetic energy plus one half mgl theta squared. <laughs> And that's equal to our constant. That's something you, it's still a little messy, but, you, but the trig function, trig substitution is just trig substitution. You can integrate that directly. You can do that. So it's not hard. Uh, yeah, I'll probably put it in my notes and sketch of that. Uh, but when we're given a problem like this, sometimes it's actually easier to just differentiate first and see what you get. Because I, I kind of like to get rid of this power and make it linear and theta. Yeah, it seems like that would make it simpler, maybe. And so differentiating does that. Uh, it does turn it back into a second order differential equation, of course, which is what I would have, which in fact turns out to be the equation I would have gotten if I just started with forces. So we kind of thought we were doing something simple and we're going to go back to the way we did it before, but okay. So zero is dE by dt. So we can use the conservation of energy. It's not changing the function of time. So when I differentiate, I get the set of t equal to zero. Okay? That's kind of nice. So that's equal to um, m. There's a square missing here, right? And yeah, so check the units, okay? So ML, so ML squared beta dot, beta double dot uh, is the, so that's the derivative of the kinetic energy term plus MGL theta. So I can divide out the M. Uh, and one of the powers of L, and I get uh, L theta, oh, sorry, theta dot. I need that here now. So thinking of d by dt of theta squared would be theta theta dot. Times two. Okay. So, which, which is going to be handy because I divide it out. That's the way I need it there. Plus g times theta is equal to zero. So the whole dot. You've seen this equation before. That's why mass on a spring. So. We just write it with the phase all dot on one side. This is my simple harmonic oscillator equation again. So for small motions, my pendulum is just like a mass on a strip. It's a different mechanical system, but it's an equation of motion in, in theta now is just like the mass on a strip. <laughs> So I don't need to do any more work because I know what the solution is from, from having done it with the mass and the spring. Theta as a function of time is some constant times cosine omega t plus five, where if I substitute back into the equation, I learn that omega is the square root of g over l. That's my angular frequency of this oscillator. So, so we have a, um, a feature here that, that we 
seen by example that uh, even for very complicated systems, if you have small motion, it's often just simple harmonic oscillator motion. Yeah. How do you define small? Ah. Good question. <laughs> Or do you just assume problems in this class are going to be small? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, we're basically going to use assume that things are small, but we have to define what we mean by small. Here, what we mean by small is that <coughs> beta is much, much less than one. So this expansion uh, converges nicely, uh, and so that we can, so that the higher order terms, uh, you know, you said theta squared is much, much less than theta in the fourth. So the next order term is much smaller than the term that we're keeping. So this is the, this is the order we're neglecting. So this is what we're keeping. And then in practical terms, if you're actually trying to engineer something, you have to evaluate what that smallness criterion is. I mean, it's a, it's a requirement of your engineering. If you're, going to do, if you're going to build something that depends on this, uh, you want to see, for example, uh, uh, well, you want to see how much error you're going to make by neglecting this term. So you can actually go and calculate the next order term, see how big it is, for whatever it is you're trying to do, the period maybe. If the period is what important is important to you, if you have a constant period over some uh, period of time, and that it's given by what we derived here, you have to make sure that the correct. So, so that would, you know, the period is related to this. You know, two pi over omega is the period, and we calculated it from G and L. The actual period is not going to be that, depending on how, how much, how big your motion is. Because the question is, how big is the error you're making? So it's a practical question. It depends, it depends on the situation, how small is small, how small is really. I don't know if that answers the question or not. Yeah, I mean, it's not a number I can give you. It, it depends, the answer is uh, but we will be interested here uh, in small motion, uh, and, and I, will, I will tell you that. We may diverge occasionally on the large motion. But the size? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> First one's right. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I had a question before. So, um, in the Taylor expansion, uh, so the second term, like e d theta, um, we you said it was MGL sine theta, right? And um, but before we defined u as MGL one minus cosine theta. So where did that d u d theta come from? So this is just. Think of this as an arbitrary function of theta. Uh, assume it doesn't have any singularities anymore. But, but just take this as an arbitrary function of theta. The Taylor, you can express that in terms of the Taylor series expansion. So this is just a general mathematical expression. So it doesn't depend on. So 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 for any so for any function as long as it doesn't have any singularities, you can write this as the sum from k equals zero to infinity. Of, um, of, uh, of zero, say, of uh, let me write it this way, of theta minus zero, say, if I'm doing an expansion about theta equals zero, so the k power divided by k factorial times k derivative of q with respect to theta evaluated at theta equals zero. So that's a theory. For any function that doesn't have a singularity of zero. Okay. Uh, so, okay, I mean, maybe 
Did not everybody have seen it in their math courses? I, just, I was not. You okay? Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, otherwise, we should realize that. Okay. All right, so let's see how we do it. Okay, so I want to do one more, one more example. I want to do a harmonic oscillator beyond mechanics. We, we, we did one in our demo. We did an LC circuit. So just an example, LC circuit. So what do we have? We have a capacitor tied to an inductor. And we can put a voltmeter or this one's go across that, across that system. Okay. That's supposed to be a voltmeter. <coughs> and so we're going to measure the voltage as a function of time. Say. Or maybe something we're going to do as a function of time. So we have capacitor C and inductor L. We put some charge Q of T on the points of this capacitor. So time t equals zero, maybe we put some charge in the capacitor. That's what we did with the square wave. We put some charge at time at the beginning of the square wave that's on the capacitor. Okay. So q is the q is the charge of the capacitor as a function of time, so maybe q is what we want to find the time dependence of to solve this problem. So what is q of t? Okay, well, let's see. We know some of the products. We know that the voltage V of T. So the voltage across the capacitor is just 1 over C times the charge on the capacitor. Q equals C times V. Okay. We also know that the voltage across the inductor is L times the rate of change of the current, LDI by dt. And of course, these two, those, that one and that one just must be the same thing because they're just connected by wires. Okay, so what's I? I is dq by dt. If I define I to be what goes down here, we can use L T, then we get I of T is minus the Q by dt as a function of time. You know, the current, the charge is decreasing, it's going through that current. So it's minus the Q by dt. Okay, so that means we get a differential equation that says that the voltage across the capacitor is the same as the voltage across the inductor. It says 1 over C Q of t is equal to minus L times the second derivative of Q, because I have to take di by dt. So I get that derivative of minus n comes in there. I'm done. That's a simple harmonic oscillator again. Uh, what's the frequency? Omega is 1 over the square root of LC. And we have Q as a function of time is just A cosine of omega T plus A. I'm using A here instead of what I used before, which was C, because C is the capacitance as well. So I don't want to get too confused. <coughs> uh, I can take the derivative of this and get the current. 
So this is like position and velocity, if you like, for the other problem. Can you still see this? Get rid of this, I guess. That's 90 degrees out of phase for the charge. This is a sine compared to the cosines, because that means different. Just like our position and velocity were on the spring, same thing. Um, when i is equal to zero, q is equal to plus or minus a, so q is at an extreme. When q is equal to zero, i is equal to plus or minus a omega. I is an extreme. What about the energy? <sighs> All energy. Well, we know what the energy is on a capacitor. It's one half CV squared. And we know what the energy in a vector is. One half L I squared. So let's see, in terms of, so that's V and I. If I write this in terms, uh, we express V in terms of Q, so V is Q over C, so let me rewrite it that way. That's one half um, Q squared over C plus one half LI squared. Plug in what the expressions are for this for function of time, and I get. Uh, one half a squared over c cosine squared omega t plus phi. So that's this. And then from this, one half uh, a squared again, uh, l omega squared, a squared omega squared times sine squared omega t. Plus phi. Uh, let's see. So now I can use the fact that omega squared is just one over LC, because omega was one over square root of LC. And then I find nice things happen. They all cancel. So I get a squared over C and a squared over C here. And so the energy is just one half a squared over C, which has no time dependence. A is a constant. C is a constant. Constant. Energy is conserved. Story and make it a little more familiar with A equals Q max, which is just C times V max, the maximum voltage that the circuit gets across it. We see that E is equal to one half C times V max squared. 
squared. So, the to so that's just that's just this piece when V is equal to V max. Well, when the voltage is maximum, the current uh, through the inductor is zero. What's happening is all the energy in the system is oscillating between being all, all in the electric field on the capacitor when V is max and being all in the magnetic field <coughs> on the inductor when V is minimum equals zero. So the energy is sloshing back and forth, the electric energy and magnetic energy sloshing back and forth. Just like in the spring, it's sloshing back and forth between potential energy and kinetic energy. So even though these are quite different systems, uh, the same theme of simple harmonic oscillator, oscillator, oscillator motion uh, applies. And the pendulum it applies as long as we go to small motion. So that's a theme in much of, much of what we do. Uh, so we did note along the way that we do lose energy typically in these systems, in a real system. Uh, and so that's something that we maybe have to deal with. Uh, and we can also have these systems have an external force that's, that's driving them. Uh, we have a sort of external force that's driving them and they're going to oscillate in response to that, in addition to these kind of transient responses that I've been looking at. So we're going to get to that next week.